again for the Union, uh, for the Western Pacific. <laughs> fade him out unfortunately i'm sorry he's just gonna keep going for it as long as he uh has the chance that was john fahey um been listening to a lot of john fahey recently don't know why my man my man is cool i mean he knows how to play the guitar i guess that's why i've been listening to him um so funny in every video that you look up of him he's just drunker than a goddamn skunk maybe that's not funny maybe people should drink less but um you know very funny cool stuff that guy rocks. That video specifically, if you like just kind of like, you know, cool guitar, like acoustic stuff, like you're a sicko like me, go check it out. It was, oh fuck, I already closed it. What was it called? It's on YouTube. It's him playing at the New Region. No, the New Region? Is that what it's called? The New, New Varsity. Check it out on YouTube. It rocks. You'll see what I mean. He's fucking drunk. Anyway, hello. <coughs> I'm sick. I'm very sick. 
of a day, a night in today because I'm trying to get better because I'm going away this weekend, which will be very nice before then and I record next week's episode. But there are a couple things I wanted to talk about. Also, I'm telling you I'm sick because who knows how long this is going to last. Who knows how long my voice is going to hold up for. But Dan and I are going back to The Dialectical Biologist, this book, for next week. Last time we spoke about this book, we read section one, um, which was all about evolution and like trying to get past a like so-called Cartesian bourgeois view of evolution. Um, it was really, really good. Uh, that section was called On Evolution. Uh, this time we're skipping section two, which is on analysis, and we're going straight to science as a social product and the social product of science. That section starts out with a little bit on um, Lysenko, which we're not reading because I feel like we just need to read that. And instead, we're going ahead and we're... Ugh, fuck, I already closed it. We're reading four chapters from it all about basically like science and how it's researched and how it's researched under capitalism and how that affects different spheres of scientific study. Um, but we're going to talk specifically today about one of those chapters um, that I just got done reading. It's the second one that we're reading for the show. So we're reading four, like I said, and it's called The Political Economy of Agricultural Research. It fucking rocks. It's really, really good. I, I wish I read it like a while ago because it really is quite excellent. But to begin... Um, we're going to read something from, what is this? The Financial Times, um, and it is called, it is from June, yeah, June of this year. It's by somebody named Helen Thomas. There she is. She looks very nice. And it's called Murky World of Global Food Trading is Too Important to Ignore. And the little sub subheading there is dominance by a handful of companies over the flows of grain and other commodities deserves much more scrutiny. What could that mean, and why are we talking about the fucking Financial Times um, for this communist live stream. Well, you'll see. So I'm just going to get it. It's pretty short. So I reckon we just read it. Um, and it's full of a bunch of good stuff. So Helen, she starts it out uh, with a quote from a fellow named Dan Morgan in his 1979 book, The Merchants of Grain, which sounds fun. And Dan Morgan says, perhaps it was this ancient nightmare, <coughs> fuck, my voice is already going, of the middleman merchant that made them all so aloof and secretive, the old fear that in moments of scarcity or famine, the people would blame them all for the misfortunes, march upon their granaries, and confiscate their stocks. So Helen Thomas, don't know who she is. She's already basically starting off with a call for revolution, as far as I can tell, secretively hidden in the uh, annals of the uh, Financial Times. Good for her. So what, why is she bringing this up? She says, This time it is not hunger that thrusts the companies that control the world's grain flows into the spotlight, but deal-making. The combination of U.S.-listed, I think it's pronounced Bungie, or <laughs> it's either Bungie or Bung. I think it's Bungie. With Glencore-backed competitor Viterra and an $8.2 billion deal, brings together two of the world's biggest traders of grains, oil seeds, and other agricultural commodities, further tightening the grip of a handful of low-profile companies on the global market. Interesting. It is the biggest reshaping of the top tier of agricultural commodities since Cargill, who we will talk more about uh, in a moment, long the biggest of the pack, bought the grain assets of Continental in 1999. The deal will catapult Bungie? Bung? <laughs> Maybe I'll just call it Bung. Into second place among the four global traders who will go by the shorthand ABCD. Kind of doesn't really make any sense, but those include Archer Daniels Midland and Louis Dreyfus. Uh, and while the alphabetic label is outdated and the market has changed dramatically since the 70s, concerns about the concentrated system of global food production remain. A concentrated system of global food production. That's what we're going to be talking about. How did we get here? And um, where do we go from here? Mm, we'll see. We'll see. And it's funny, right? Because people have been talking <coughs> at all about like <coughs> grain shipments and grain distribution recently because of the war in Ukraine, because there have been some hiccups, shall we say, in the kind of, you know, usually very smooth uh, running of global food networks and global food chains. But um, as we see under um, almost all aspects of capitalism, we see a tendency towards monopoly and, as we'll also get into, towards monopsony, the redheaded stepchild of monopoly. So despite some emergent in pub, some emergence in public markets and social media, it remains hard to get <clears throat> good figures on companies that, whether you're farming or eating, are impossible to avoid. <clears throat> Listen, I got a lem sip here. I'm doing my best. One oft-used stat is that the quartet controls 70, 
to 90% of global trade in cereal grains. A figure, and then I love this, a figure, that's probably too high. 90%, that's probably too high for the free market that I'm used to. Free market capitalism, that's what I thought was, you know, the case. I always thought there were free markets, and that totally didn't have a tendency towards monopoly at all. What are you going to do? After the food shortages and the price spikes of 2008 to 2012, China pushed hard into agricultural trading through state-owned Kafko, <laughs> which has muscled into the big four. Jonathan Kingsman, whose 2019 book updated Morgan's Classic, reckoned that the five plus by Terra and Singapore's Wilmar, these are such dull, boring names, except for Bung, I like Bung, handle half of the international train in grain and oil seeds. Such dominance is worrying. The classic hourglass model of market power in food Again, that's what we're going to be talking about today, too. <clears throat> Involves a vast number of producers supplying a similarly huge number of consumers via a tight group of processors and traders. The deal makers stress their complementary strengths, but regulators, rightly, will take a closer look. Blah, 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 blah. Trader, and then she goes on to describe what traders actually are. <clears throat> She says that's a bit of a misnomer. The group doesn't make money simply by shifting group goods from A to B. In recent years, they have expanded upstream into agricultural origination, storage, freight, and port infrastructure, and downstream <clears throat> into processing ingredients and final products while moving into a wider range of foodstuffs. Okay, this is very important. It's what we're going to be talking about when we finally get to the chapter of the dialectical biologist. Big issue here is that when you have this vertical integration, it creates an intermediate it creates a huge intermediary power from farmers to consumers, says Jennifer Clapp. Bungie's straight strengths in processing and downstream, plus Viterra's in merchandising and handling, creates a much more integrated global company. So basically, the picture that she's painting here is that um, the global food chain, away from farming itself, through things like infrastructure and trading and, you know, merchandising and handling and processing and all of this stuff uh, has become remarkably centralized and remarkably um, based around just like four or five, maybe six companies um, for the entire planet, which is insane. And one of those companies is like China's state-owned company. So this is, we're talking big stuff here, fellas. And it's funny because it's like, you know, you never hear about these. When you think about agriculture, all you think about is just like food being grown in the ground and then somehow it gets to you <laughs> to your mouth right uh a lot more goes into it than that and these are the companies that kind of control everything so we'll skip a little bit disruption thanks to a change in climate is becoming the rule rather than the exception traders keep food moving during crises and periods of price volatility such as the pandemic and russia's invasion of ukraine but such events are also good for business with surging sales and record profits last year sick the market is already in flux. Kafko's emergence remains a top tier of ABCC, replacing a commercially motivated trader with a geopolitically focused one. Again, this is something that we won't talk about when we get into the dialectical biologist, but she makes an interesting point here, right? Where she's like, actually, uh, uh, food commerce, for lack of a better uh, term, is slowly becoming, with the emergence of Kafko, something that isn't necessarily just commercially motivated, economically motivated, kind of competition between all those firms, but also kind of like politically motivated. If only there was a branch of, say, sociology that studied something like like politics and economy. I don't know what you'd call it, like economical politics or maybe political. You know, political economy sounds stupid. Surely there was something like that in the past. Who knows what happened to it now? Um, and then she goes on to say that Abu Dhabi's sovereign wealth fund bought into Louis Dreyfus in 2020, while Saudi's commodities investment company took a third stake in Olam Agri last year. Meanwhile, post-2008 efforts to establish a better oversight led by France at the G20 um, largely failed. That's yeah, a shame. It wasn't sufficient, says this person. Um, and today's needs are much, much greater. Whatever. Bungie's deal will prompt competition watchdogs to scrutinize a world of agricultural trading again. And everybody else should, too. Okay, well, then she ends it with the, you know, liberal bullshit of like, oh, we just need, we just need uh, ideology of better control and regulation of the markets and then everything would be fine. Get the good people in power, you know, put the good people in power of Bung or the CEO, replace the CEO of Bungie and everything will be fine. Of course, we know that that is not the case. Um, yeah, so now let's get into the dialectical biologist. One other thing on this, which 
you know, whenever you run into like a permaculture person and they're like, we just can't, <coughs> we can't be producing grains um, ecologically. We need to end grain production because, you know, uh, 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 we need polycultures or whatever. Uh, very silly. I'll say that. Um, you know, you might look at this and be like, well, maybe we need to like relocalize food production and, you know, uh, what is it like food sovereignty, et cetera, et cetera. And we need to rethink the way that we create things. We still need grains. Everybody would die if we stopped producing grains. There's a reason these companies are huge. The ones, even if it's just a company that controls like oil seeds and fucking like, you know, grain, everybody needs grain. Everybody needs rice. Uh, so we need to figure out a way to do that ecologically. Q. Oh, <laughs> nope. There we go. Q, the dialectical biologist, chapter nine. Um, so again, dialectical biologist, it's here. It's also up there. Um, Lamont and Levin's reading four chapters from this book about, um, as I said at the beginning of the stream, we're going to be reading four chapters, but I just finished reading this one and I kind of wanted to do a little bit of like a close reading of it, partially so I can go back and make some notes as I do when we do readings, but then also because like, you know, uh, I thought it was very interesting. So we'll get into that now. This section, again, I read it out at the beginning of the stream, but the section that this chapter is from is called Science as a Social Product and the Social Product of Science. So it's all about how is science used under capitalism? Um, how is it changed? Uh, where is it going? Why does it suck? And um, agriculture, agricultural science and research, understandably, a very important part of scientific research. So they dedicate a whole chapter to talking about it. We'll talk more about this on the show. Um, I think we're just going to go through right now the first couple pages and probably end, yeah, end here at the social objectives of agriculture section. So I'll read this first bit um, and you'll see why I wanted to start with that essay or that article from the Financial Times. Um, it's not just because I'm bourgeois. So chapter nine, political economy of agricultural research. Also, just to say, this PDF, the only PDF that you can find of this book online is, like, completely fucked. And so there are going to be a million different uh, typos in here. Ignore them. What are you going to do? I'm going to do my best. I got my copy here, my hard copy, so I can refer to it if something's completely unreadable. But let's just get right into it. Um, on the face of it, they say, agricultural production in the United States seem to present a difficult, seems, seems to present a difficulty to political economic theory, which is to say Marxist theory. An important sphere of production <clears throat> seems to have resisted the usual penetration of capitalism. And this is kind of true, right? Like we were just talking about how there's this tendency towards monopoly and all of these different agricultural entities, but we didn't really say anything about actual farmers, right? And when you go and you look at the like hellscape of the American Midwest, sorry for people from the Midwest, and you just see how its ecology has been changed for thousands of miles into literally just cornfields, <laughs> you know, say like Iowa or something like that. Um, you can, you notice that these are not all owned by like four companies, like the kind of processing and distribution companies or aspect of agriculture is. These are all owned by kind of like petty bourgeois farmers. And it's kind of the same thing for cattle as well. It's not the same thing for poultry production, which we'll get into in a second. That is just kind of entirely like centralized and um, for various reasons, which we'll talk about here in a sec, there have been monopolies that have sprung up, but not in farming per se. In the actual growing of crops, there's a lot of petty bourgeois producers, and it seems to be relatively like that's kind of where things are staying. So they say, why is this? This is the big question of this uh, first part of this chapter. Why is it that agricultural production in the United States uh, has resisted this trend, this teleological trend that we all know we're supposed to see under capitalism, which is centralization and monopolization, right? Ships and sh sh oh, Jesus Christ. Ships and shoes are produced by a relatively small number of very large corporations with huge capital investment, but the production of cabbages <laughs> has remained firmly in the hands of two and a half million petty producers. Why is technological change and concentration of capital, as seen in manufacturing, transportation, and extractive industries, not taken over agricultural production as well? An answer is sometimes given in that agriculture is simply lagged behind and that monopoly capitalism is finally catching up with it. This is fake news. I'm going to skip the next bit. I don't need to get into the statistics. Go read it if you want to. Starting back here. 
Of the three, the answer is that this doesn't really meet the facts. However, of the three million farm operators who disappeared between 1900 and the present, and the present, I think this book was written in like, it's like almost 50 years old now at this point. So things will have changed. Yeah, it was, was written in 1985. So things definitely will have changed. But they say of all the people who disappeared between 1900 and 1985, two million were tenant farmers. The proportion of all families run by man, all farms run by managers, less than one percent rather than family units, has not changed. And big corporations have actually divested themselves of farmland in recent years. There is simply no rush to make farms into immense General Motors corporations. So if you're a Marxist, you should be like, I'm throwing up my hands. This makes no sense. Why is this happening? My world, it's, it's coming undone. They say, don't lose the faith just yet. The basic problem in analyzing capitalist development in agriculture is the confusion between farming and and agriculture. Okay, that, uh, you know what? Should I zoom in for everybody? Is that better? Yeah, there we go. We'll do that. So basically they're saying, first of all, you need to understand that there's a difference between farming and agriculture. They say they define farming here as the process of turning seed, fertilizer, pesticides, and water into cattle, potatoes, corn, and cotton by using land, machinery, and human labor on the farm, right? So if you're, ma if you're growing crops as a farmer, it's, it's, you know, it's you doing the farming. It's you raising the crops. It's you harvesting them, and that's it. Uh, if you're making cattle, uh, it's you raising the cattle, and then I guess sending them off to be slaughtered, right? Um, agriculture, on the other hand, they say, includes farming, but also includes all of those processes that go into making, transporting, and selling the seed, machinery, and chemicals used by the farmer, and all of the transportation, food processing, and selling that go on from the moment a potato leaves the farm to the moment it enters a consumer's mouth as a potato chip. This is very, very important. From the moment a potato leaves the farm until it enters the consumer's mouth as a potato chip. So this is kind of what I was saying when we were reading the article on like Cargill and them, right? It's like, <clears throat> unless you're one of these... You know, Marx hassled these kinds of people. These people that were just like, we just need to return to petty producers, right? Uh, I want potatoes, so my society is I just grow potatoes out in my backyard. That, like, incredibly petty B fascist fucking, like, ideology that you see amongst many so-called anarchists and socialists um, today. Like, hyper return to not just localization, but, like, tradition, which is, like, incredibly absurd. And we don't even need to get into why that's stupid. They're basically saying that that isn't all that farming is. Farming isn't just growing crops. Farming is like, okay, where are all of your inputs coming from? Where is your phosphorus coming from for the soil? What's your nitrogen source? Uh, you know, I suppose. And then like processing of your grains to turn them into olive oil or your seeds to turn them into olive oil. Processing of your grains to turn them into flour. And then beyond that, the actual transportation to get them to the place that bakes bread or that makes olive oil. And then beyond that, to get them to the stores to then finally get them to you. That's what agriculture is. Agriculture is everything that goes into making and producing food, you know, things for textiles, that kind of thing, right? Farming is growing peanuts. Agriculture is turning petroleum into peanut butter. Side note, just had a slice of peanut butter toast right before we started this as a little snack. Uh, many have said that peanut butter is the greatest food on the planet. And many more will say that. We claim that if agricultural production is viewed as a complete process, capitalists completely penetrated it in the United States, and technological change has played the same role in this penetration as in all the other productive sectors. So this is their thesis. I'll read it again. We claim that if agricultural production is viewed as a complete process, capital has completely penetrated it in the United States, and technological change has played the same role uh, in that penetration as it has in all other productive sectors. So let's see how they back it up, because they're basically saying that, you know, this theory of uh, monopolization and technological change and, you know, disciplining of the labor force, which is something that they'll get into here in a second, all actually does take place in agriculture. And that um, there's a reason that big capital wants nothing to fucking do with farms. So they say the most striking change in the nature of agricultural production in the United States since the turn of the century is the composition of inputs, the seed, fertilizer, energy, water, land and labor used by the farmer in production. Um, and then they get into a little bit of statistical modeling here using index values. And I'm going to read this out because I do think it's important. But just to say, index values are kind of simple. It's used in something like this is used in sabermetrics a lot in like baseball, kind of like statistical analysis. So just to show you what they're doing here, they're basically taking one set of statistics from one year 
giving them a base value of 100 and then comparing all other years to that 100. Basically, in the sense that, like, if, say, production goes up 25%, then you'll have an index value of 125. If it goes down 25%, it'll be 75%. So again, in baseball, you have this, there's a, let's say, there's a series of stats called plus stats, which are basically ways of, like, again, normalizing different um, either hitters' performances or um, pitchers' performances. So let's take a stat like OPS plus, which is a, a offensive stat. OPS is a stat that is literally just your on base, how often a guy in baseball gets on base, and you add it together with your slugging percentage, which is a way of measuring how hard, not how hard they hit the ball, but for how many bases they basically get per hit, because a single isn't the same as a home run, isn't the same as a triple, right? So OPS plus is a way of giving index values to show a hitter's performance uh, in any given offensive environment. So again, a every single year, no matter what the environment is, an OPS plus of 100 would be perfectly average replacement level offensive production. 125 would be 25% better than that. Uh, and I believe my man Mookie Betts uh, is one of the best offensive producers in the league right now. He's probably up there with like a one. I don't know what he's at these days. I want to say like 160. My man's doing well. So anyway, that would mean 60% better. So they say you know, now we'll actually get into it. This value can be compared from year to year by establishing some year as an arbitrary base with the index value of 100 and expressing all other years relative to it. So here, their index value year is going to be 1967 for whatever reason. That's just going to be what they chose to be like, not an average year, but the year that they want to compare everything else to. So they say that total value of inputs into farming rose from an index value of 85 in 1910 to about 100 in 1975 which was the same as in 1967. This is not a very great increase, but the nature of these inputs changed drastically. Inputs on the farm, inputs that were actually produced on the farm itself went from an index value of 175 all the way down to 90 between 1910 and 1975, while the index value of inputs purchased from outside the farm rose from 38 to 105. So ignore everything else I've just said, because the simple way to explain it is just that farmers are no longer producing their own inputs uh, at anything close to historical rates, they are now basically getting their inputs from off the farm. And that takes the form of buying seeds every single year or every couple of years as opposed to just saving them because all crops are now genetically modified so that you fucking can't save your seeds. Um, as well as they're no longer, they no longer really include animals on their farms, so they can't just use all their manure to enrich their soil so they have to buy things like nitrogen and phosphorus and you know potassium and all of that from different companies um inputs made on the farm going down inputs made off the farm that are imported to the farm going up that is to say that farmers used to grow their own seed raise their own horses and mules raise the hay and livestock that they ate and spread manure over the fields from the horses or from the animals that they owned now, farmers buy their seed from Pioneer Hybrid Seed Company, their mules from the Ford Motor Company, the hay to feed those mules from Exxon, and the manure from Union Carbide. Union Carbide? Where do I know them from? Surely they're a good company. Thus, farming has changed from a productive process, which originated most of its own inputs and converted them into outputs, to a process that passes materials and energy through from an external supplier to an external buyer. So in this sense, farmers are literally just like... I don't know. Uh, they're kind of like a weird version of middlemen where you have like big, massive capitalist firms before the productive process takes place, the actual on-farm on productive process, I should say. Then you have like petty bourgeois middlemen in the middle who basically produce all of the food, do the important productive process, and then they sell all of that stuff to like massive fuck-off monopoly firms. And as we'll see here in a second, uh, oftentimes it's the same firm, which is very funny. You can buy a lot of your inputs from Cargill, and then you might wind up selling all of your shit to Cargill out the other side, which uh, would be funny. Well, it's kind of funny. If they were if they were like peasants or, you know, workers, it wouldn't be so funny. They're petty bourgeois, what are you going to do? So they say at present, only 10% of the value added in agriculture is actually added on the farm. That's a pretty staggering claim. And I would wonder how much that's changed since 1985. Presumably a lot. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? In like 40 years. Presumably that has changed a lot. But 40% of the value is added in creating the inputs. 
which is insane, but then even more value and, you know, value, this isn't capital V value. This is, they're saying, you know, I guess suppose like price, that's how they define value here. Yeah. They say here at each stage of the transformation of form by the labor expended on it, it adds value and the total value added is the difference between price in the original raw materials and the final product consumed. So yeah, they are kind of just talking about price when they say value. Um, and then 50% is added in the post productive kind of processing, transportation and exchange after the farm commodities leave the farm gate. That's pretty fucking crazy. So then they say to sum up farm production is now only a small fraction of agricultural production. There you go. There's your answer as to why it seems like, uh, farming is like a gotcha moment for marxism because it it hasn't followed those teleological phases that we all know and love which is you know real subsumption well formal subsumption and real subsumption surely these things if marxism was correct you fool surely by now farms and farmers in the united states would have undergone real subsumption the answer is that they have and that what real subsumption farming actually looks like is just getting the petty bourgeoisie to do the like really lame non-profitable bullshit um and they talk a little bit here about labor productivity i'm going to skip that we can talk about that more on the show um actually should we talk about it now this is something that we talked about a little bit. Jason W. Moore was pretty hugely influenced by this book, very obviously. If you read uh, Capitalism in the Web of Life and his kind of ontological stance on like anti-Cartesian reductionism. But also in this chapter, you can tell because there's an entire chapter of his book, which is up there somewhere, where he talks about like um, the different phases of American agriculture and world agriculture, I should say, actually. And it's kind of being cribbed from this from this chapter it's just an expanded on version and i spoke about this at, in some other live streams so just go find that one um but basically he's talking here about the different forms of subsumption that agriculture in america has taken and it has to do a lot with um technological change throughout the years kind of you know mechanical tractors to um, chemical inputs uh to where we're at now um which is kind of like supply chain fudging um and he says that it's important to recognize that the kind of like chemical innovations in pesticides, as well as the like genetic um, innovations in genetic engineering of certain seeds, um, as well as mechanical innovations in farm equipment, um, that those are not the product, they say here, of agricultural research, but of entrepreneurial capitalism. And this is kind of the purpose, I think, of them writing this chapter, because this whole book is really kind of what it is, what it is really about is how do you do science dialectically, man? Um, and so I think that one of the things that gets really stuck in their craw here as scientists is, um, you know, like uh, uh, the fact that agricultural research isn't being done properly, dude. Uh, it's all capitalism is just fucking it all up. Um, and they also say that you know, as we've seen in a million different readings on the show, that um, labor processes are at the heart of all of these changes. When you're not actually doing utility-based, I guess is how you would call it, or, you know, maybe just socialist research, and you're doing capitalist entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship that just so happens that you need to do scientific research to get to those, you know, changes that you need under capitalism or whatever, um, that those are always driven by the labor process. Um, labor processes, I should say. And so they say here that farmers, like other producers, are under constant pressure to reduce their labor uh, costs. The introduction of the reaper came 20 years before the labor shortage of the Civil War, for example. But in addition, farmers are under an unusually strong pressure to control the labor process, not simply reduce the payroll. And so this is something interesting. I read that sentence that farmers are under an unusually strong pressure to control the labor process, not simply to reduce the payroll. And I was like, oh, interesting. They're doing some kind of like anarchist critiques of Marxism, which is that they're not talking about power dynamics as much, which I always kind of appreciate. It feels a bit woo woo, but I do appreciate it because it's like power dynamics are something that we have to deal with every day in our lives. And oftentimes Marxists get caught up in the abstract kind of like big, uh, you know, capitalists don't do these things to keep you, you know, under control and a power dynamic. Capitalists do these things because they need to accumulate. And any Marxist worth their salt will tell you that that's not true, right? The power dynamics play into it. But what they're actually saying here is 
they need to control their labor, the labor underneath them, um, basically, because if they don't, accumulation is going to slow down and stop, right? So they say a strike by harvest workers results in a total loss of the product, not simply postponement of production. Um, workers' carelessness can cause crop loss or damage, but it's very hard to supervise farm labor or to regulate its speed. For that reason, piecework is common in harvesting, but piecework puts a premium on total speed without quality control. There's a whole chapter on this uh, in Capital. Not going to get into that now because it did my head in when I was uh, reading it, but it's all very, very good. So, basically, they're saying that it's very difficult to do a um, kind of like Fordist production line on um, farms, which makes sense. It's not an easy thing to do. And then they say that the effect this technology has, and here's one of these typos, the effect of the technology has been to reduce the value added on the farm and increase the value of purchased inputs. That is to say, the chief consequence of technological innovation to increase on-farm productivity has been to make on-farm productivity less and less important in determining agricultural value. So there's this weird kind of like dynamic where the petty bourgeoisie who are running the farms actually kind of want to um, shift the value around from on-farm to off-farm um, productive value. And again, value. Um, it's important to note that not all changes on the um, in value added on the farm are the consequence of technological change in agriculture. They list, you know, they list here like oil prices have quite a bit to do with the proportion of value that's added on the farm versus off the farm. And then they get into research, right? And they basically talk about how research is carried out by suppliers, seed companies, machinery companies, chemical companies is clearly designed, how it's all clearly designed to maximize the use of purchased inputs, which is to say, keep, you know, the most obvious example of this is that if you're a petty bourgeois farmer uh, growing corn, like actual corn, like ears of corn maize, um, you know, 100 years ago, you would just pick out a couple ears of corn that looked good and you would save the seeds from that corn to be your crop the next year. But because so much research and development has been done, not by the companies that are actually supplying the inputs, realistically, it's done by the state and then just given to these companies who then just go on to sell it. But let's just, for the sake of argument, say done by these companies. What they're actually doing is they put an enormous amount of effort into growing like perfect crops, which is to say ones that will give you maximum yields that any individual producer could not produce themselves because it just takes way too much time, effort, and like kind of, to be honest, like scientific know-how to do, I guess, to crossbreed all of these different plants and get the perfect ear of corn. They then, what they also do is they make it so that that corn cannot be used for growing in the next season because its seeds are sterile, right? So what that does is it makes it so that farmers, for the first time in history, are actually reliant on um, seed companies uh, to buy their seed, whereas before you would just fucking save some of your potatoes or your corn or whatever and just get on with it next year and there would be no need for a middleman. But because the ears of corn are so good, the corn crop is so good, this genetically modified corn, you have to go back and buy it every year, um, which is a shame, I guess. You know, what are you going to do? Um, in practice, most agricultural research is directly responsive to the farmers, though, they say. Um, but the critical point is that the farmers' demands are determined by the system of production and marketing in which they're trapped. Thus, the farmer becomes an agent. I'm sorry. The farmer becomes the agent by which the providers of inputs and the purchasers of inputs use the socialized establishment of research. Agricultural research serves the needs of capital by responding to the demands of farmers because capital totally controls the chain of agricultural production and marketing. So there you go. This, you know, agriculture is actually controlled by the laws of capital that we all know and love. Only a cursory glance at farming as such would tell you otherwise and would say, but look at all of the petty bourgeois farmers. You know, capitalism, it's not centralizing. It's not, you know, coming to dominate everything. Um, it is. <laughs> As they say here, agricultural research serves the needs of capital by responding to the demands of farmers, but capital totally controls the chain of agricultural production and marketing. So there you go. What are you going to do? Um, <coughs> how much more of this is here? I am slowly losing my voice. Okay, there's a little bit left, so we'll just finish it up. Um, 
Okay, so we'll get into here. This is They're talking a little bit about seed companies here some more. So they say farmers first began using hybrid corn because it gave them an initial increase in yield over open pollinated varieties that farmers themselves have been processing or propagating. So this is kind of exactly what I was just saying. Um, and the companies that do this, uh, one of them is Cargill, which we were just talking about. Wait, nope, not there. Uh, wait, no, not there either. Where'd it go? There, we were just talking about them here in this article, The Murky World of Global Food Trading. Cargill gets mentioned here as um, one of the top tier of agricultural commodities traders. Still, 40 years later, they're still doing it. What do you know? Wow, capital, it uh, does what it's going to do. So they bring them up here to say, um, virtually no one has tried to improve on open pollinated varieties, although scientific evidence is that if the same effort had been put into such varieties, then they would be as good or better by hybrids by now. But, you, you know, you can't just expect petty producers to put in the same amount of effort as um, large monopoly capitalists, because that's just not going to happen. Um, on the contrary, there's been pressure by seed companies and commercial animal breeders to produce hybrid soybeans, chickens, cattle, and so on to convince farmers that their hybrids are actually better. Cargill, dun dun dun, and Northrop King, to name two, have spent millions in attempts to make hybrid wheat that is superior to the usual varieties, but they have not yet succeeded. But if they do, and I'm not sure if they have by now or, or what, I would imagine that something similar to that has happened in the last 40 years. They'll make millions, they say. At present, wheat farmers do need to buy new seed um, only every three to five years. Don't know about that. I don't know about that now. I'm not a wheat farmer. Um, on the marketing side, the same dependence is just as evident. Just as the procession of farm input, seed, fertilizer, pesticides, and machinery is highly monopolized, so farm outputs are purchased by monopoly buyers, monopsonists, monopoly buyers. So, you know, in that murky world uh, article that we just read, the Financial Times one, where she says that there's like this hourglass structure. She uses it in kind of a different, to mean a different thing, a different metaphor. But here it's completely true, right? Like, they say here, Cargill buys the grain, Hunt buys tomato, Anderson Clayton buys cotton. Cargill pays for soybeans. Well, actually, we'll get to that here in a second. But that is to say, Cargill is literally supplying farmers their seeds. And then in certain cases, it's literally got the monopoly. It has the monopsony on buying from them, right? So it has a monopoly on inputs. <laughs> it's so fucking maddening. And then the monopsony on buying the actual products. So there you go. What are you going to do? Um, but then they say here, another wrinkle in this, which is even more maddening, um, is that Cargill pays for soybeans based on the regional average protein content, but there's a negative correlation between yield and protein, obviously. So it does not pay a farmer to use a higher protein variety with lower yield. Therefore, plant breeders go for yield, not protein. So this is how we get shitty soybeans. <laughs> Thank you, capitalism and innovation. Um... In summary, because farmers are a small, although essential part of the production of food, the conditions of their part of production are set by monopolistic providers and monopsonistic buyers of farm inputs and outputs. The agricultural research establishment, by serving the proximate demands of farmers, is a fact, a research establishment captured by capital. The farmers are only the message, messengers of messages written in corporate headquarters. Sick, dude. So then they go on to say, to end up this little section on why uh, American agriculture is, in fact, uh, really subsumed to capital, they say, who benefits from this? Well, they say the consumer hasn't benefited because basically uh, the ratio of food prices in 1970 to that 1930 was 2.48, and the ratio for all purchased goods and services was 2.33. So food has become not cheaper, but relatively more expensive, even though farm productivity has risen rapidly. Wow, who could have seen that coming? They also go on to say that even though there's been um, an increase in fat and a decrease in carbohydrate consumption, there's been no long-term change in um since 1910, at least, in protein. So they basically say people are eating more and they're uh, not eating more cheaply. Or oh, I'm sorry, they're not eating more and they're not eating more cheaply, which is awesome. And the shit that we are eating is just full of fat and full of, you know, garbage and it's not actually healthy for you. Talk about, you know, there's no protein in my goddamn soybeans. Then they say that the farmer themselves actually hasn't benefited because, you know, and they get into some stuff about how debt, the ratios of debt to actual, you know, uh, profit, I suppose, have remained more or less the same in the last hundred years. Um, 
and they say that net income per operator has actually increased two and a half times since 1910, but almost all of that comes from the elimination of poor farmers, um, basically meaning sharecroppers and tenants. That's the only reason. Not because, you know, people are getting more money. An absolute but not a relative change. So then they say who actually benefits from this? Obviously, it's the input and output capital enterprises. The providers of inputs have become very rich, not directly from increases in productivity, but from the mode of those increases, high capital inputs. Seed companies make high profits, obviously, blah, 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 blah. The companies that produce herbicides, insecticides, and fertilizers have realized enormous profits. At this moment, farm machinery providers like the automotive industry are in serious financial trouble because, yeah, whatever, can skip forward from that. So, final question for the day. Why is capital not taken over the farms themselves? Why is it that they wouldn't want to control the entire supply chain? Seems like something you would want to do if you were Cargill, right? Well, not so much. They say that there are four reasons why a company like Cargill hasn't completely taken over um, the farms themselves and just kind of wants to sit on their risk-adverse and extremely profitable methods of um, kind of, you know, input and input selling and output buying. Um, they say, first, the purchase of farmland ties up huge amounts of capital that has really low liquidity, no depreciation value for tax purposes, and uncertain market price, and that produces a low return on investment. So basically, just because immediately you wouldn't make a whole lot of money if you were to invest in farms. Second, farming is physically extensive. So this is kind of more of a quantitative question. So it is not possible to bring in large numbers of workers and productive processes together in a small place, which is something the capital needs to do, right? And it needs to do it in a way that it can discipline workers, as we saw in fossil capital, right? And the kind of shift from the flow of, uh, you know, water and wind-powered textile industries way out in the sticks in Yorkshire to, um, you know, the shifts to uh, steam power and coal-powered plants that you could fucking put anywhere, that you could abstract away from. You can't really abstract space when you're farming. You kind of need to have this kind of, you know, uh, uh, you, you can't just basically farm the same things everywhere, I suppose. And it's also just very big farmland. So you kind of, everybody's going to be able to do their own thing. Very difficult to discipline labor. Third, they say for similar reasons that the labor process is difficult to supervise and control, what I was just saying. Fourth, the turnover rate of capital is limited by the annual cycle of growth or even longer in the case of large livestock. Now, they say the test of these assumptions is chickens and poultry, that thing that might just fucking kill all of us because it's going to create a plague a million times worse than COVID one of these days. Side note, I did just take a COVID test. I don't have COVID, which is nice. Good to fucking know that COVID is just, there is a strain of COVID now that just has a one and a half percent kill rate that just exists in the global ecosystem and will continue to mutate kind of forever we 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 do not like that that is pretty fucking lame um the test of these assertions is in the exceptions in this so they say poultry production which actually is vertically integrated in a way that you would expect by large capital entrepreneurs that is to say the same corporation operates at every level of production this is a company like tyson right and this is why you gotta stop eating chicken you just gotta fucking stop the same firm produces many of the inputs, does the breeding, grows the birds, slaughters them, processes them, and sells them en masse to fast food chains and supermarkets. Mar supermarkets? Supermarkets. Poultry takes little space and lends itself to factory organization of production with depreciable capital equipment and an easily supervised labor process. Basically, chickens are born. You fucking pump them full of hormones and pump them full of food and you don't let them move you de-beak them you fucking kill them you skin them you eat their flesh and you do it all again in an extremely quick turnaround poultry farms are basically just factories right you can easily supervise the labor process you can discipline it in times of crises and there's a sh kind of fucking shit ton of fixed capital in there as well exactly what capitalism likes and this is why you see vertical integration in poultry farms but not so much in literally everything else cows take forever it, despite capitalist best efforts it still takes years for a cow to grow up and to be slaughtered right um obviously crops uh are completely different you cannot really vert vertically integrate that production process um Moreover, the cycle of capital does not depend on annual growth cycle and can be compressed further and further. Indeed, a main focus of poultry breeding is to shorten the growth period while holding constant the amount of feed consumed. Don't eat chickens. 
When we have socialism, I'll let everybody eat chicken. But now, don't eat chickens. Just don't do it. Actually, I don't really give a fuck what you do. Go ahead and do it if you want to do it. I have eaten chicken for a very long time. I no longer do it. It just fucking bums me out. Farmers, then, are a unique sector of petty producers who own some of the means of production, but whose conditions of production are completely controlled by suppliers of inputs and purchasers of outputs. They form the modern equivalent of the putting out system of the pre-factory era. They're the conduits through which the benefits of agricultural research enterprises flow to the large concentration of capital. Because of the physical nature of farming and the structure of capitalist production and investment, this is a stable situation and must be understood not as an exception, but to, but not as an exception to the rule of capital, but as one of its forms. There you go. That is the reason why there are still Trump voting, incredibly reactionary, petty bourgeois farm owners the country over and why that is not likely to change because capital does not want it to change. Capital wants to remain risk adverse. It wants to invest its money in productive processes that are easily vertically integrated, where you can easily discipline and supervise a workforce, where you can abstract away from space. And you kind of can't really do that in any type of farming except for poultry production. Funnily enough, the one that's giving us all COVID. And one last thing, and we'll get into this when we talk about this section on the show. Um, easy to do a little bit of sociology here and um, political sociology and s identify petty bourgeois farmers as an incredibly reactionary class. <laughs> you know, they're the most wretched of the classes, right? They're getting pulled in both ways. They recognize that they're getting screwed over by Cargill on both sides of the production process, but at the same time, they need to compete with each other. They need to discipline their labor forces. They need to self-exploit. They're torn in many different directions. This is why many of them vote for Trump. This is why many of them are libertarians. It just is what it is until this all changes. Uh, we're going to have them as a reactionary class, which is pretty fucking lame. Um, okay, I think I'm going to end it there. I'll finish my lem sip. We'll be back on, yeah, a week from tomorrow with an episode where we talk all about Section 3, or at least a, a good chunk of Section 3 of The Dialectical Biologist. So we'll be reading the chapter before this, The Commoditization of Science, as well as this one, The Political Economy of Agricultural Research in Its Totality, as well as the next two chapters, Applied Biology in the Third World and The Pesticide System. Um, this book fucking rocks. Go get it. Go read it. Um, the evolution stuff, if you're not an evolution person, it's a little bit tricky, but um, you'll you'll figure it out. Just skip the shit that you don't want to read. That's what Dan and I did. Um, section two, I haven't read, so I can't speak to it. And then section three, reading now, pretty fucking good. Um, it's one of the clearest, section one at least, is one of the clearest explanations, explications of dialectics that I've seen that isn't simply just thing, anti-thing, Mmm, final thing. Um, it's really, really good. And as I clang around on my desk, <coughs> I'm going to go because I'm coughing up a storm. And um, any questions, leave them down below. We can talk plenty about them. Anything that you all want to add, anything that I've got wrong, leave it below. We can talk. we got a Discord as well. 